Hello, everyone. I'm Ishan Ano, Thinking Food Futures co-curator, along with my dear colleague, Livia Alexander, who is, who is with us today. Here, we also have our curatorial assistant, Shayna Yoshida, with us. On behalf of our curatorial team, as well as Residency Unlimited, the hosting organization of this event, we are pleased to welcome you to the second day of our virtual symposium and exhibition, Thinking Food Futures. When we first started working on this event last year, well before COVID, this event was conceived by Betsy as a supra, a feast drawn by the imagination, narrative, and rhythm of poets to reconsider the food that laid on our collective table. But now we are all huddled at home, thrust against our computer screens, coming together in a digital space to still think together about questions of food justice and food resilience that have come into an even sharper focus with pandemic. We are pleased to Betsy Andrews, an award-winning poet and food writer who will be leading and moderating this panel. Betsy Andrews is the author of New Jersey, winner of the Brittingham Prize in po Poetry, and the bottom recipient of the 42 Miles Press Prize in Poetry, and con a contributing editor at Food and Wine and Eating Well, Betsy writes about food, drink, travel, and the environment for various publications. She is co-curator, along with Kerala-based poet V.K. Srilish, of Global Pandemic, publishing international poems and art witnessing to COVID-19. Her guests today are Omotara James, is a writer, editor, and visual artist, William Mazza, uses chance, duration, and accumulation to reinterpret la landscape as the relationship of people to their meditated, mediated environments through practices of live painting, performance, studio painting, animation, and collaboration. Carolyn Monastra is a Brooklyn-based artist and eco-activist whose current work focuses on the global impacts of climate change and species extinction. Sabiha Sabia Prince is an artist, urban anthropologist based in Washington, DC. VK Srilish is a poet and writer based in Kalasari, Kerala. Misha Viegas um, thread, go thread Gold is a by right ratio, a Chicana writer, I hope it, I pronounce it correctly, and poet who covers Latin issues and resistant movements. Uh, Viswan Zorba is a photographer and videographer based in Talaseri, Kerala. I welcome all of you and the stage of is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bill, can you turn on your camera? Okay, well, we have another participant. There he goes. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, uh, so thrilled to bring together a host of incredible artists and poets for um, a really exciting program today. What we're gonna do is show you our four collaborations um, that deal with uh, food and eating and the person and the body and the environment. Um, they're four collaborations between video artists and poets. And you will hear the poets' voices and see the videos. We're gonna show them straight through. And then after that, we'll have a group discussion. And in the last 10, 15 minutes, we'll bring in questions from the audience. Um, and we really uh, welcome and honor your participation with us. Um, so without further ado, Isan, if you would like to show the videos. My fingers were pudgy little pellets, 
succulent and red and a lot softer like them tomatoes mom brought home holding like a prayer one fell off a dissonant syllable take it she said putting away the rest for my baby's curry for later but she pellets folded over the tart rotten dish gleaming skin like my mother's nasty where in the evening a sun would emerge as we sat on the veranda as one in the trees went down leaving smoke and gold that was long before dad went walking towards the attic looking cop car with the tarpaulin top as he is i don't know him to nobody lost to a shut up the car took him to a place where he would stay for months never seeing ours then her no step got dark like a rotten tomato that was long afterwards when one petulant yell raided all corners of our nation then silence fell and one knife came dwelling deep into him his flesh was an appended can of tomato ketchup then lots of tomatoes exploded in our streets sitting by the oil lamp painting on the wall hideous arcs that worst nightmare couldn't I sang Padji pellets into the tomatoes bulbo softness yes just for fun just for fun mom called from across the kitchen eat it don't play with it her voice again don't spill its belly on the bed i dug and dug the skin wouldn't come off first then all poured out bleeding like stabbed like my father's friend did after being stabbed whose belly my dad said burst like a tomato dad wouldn't want them any more in his curry then i thought i wouldn't want them either until my wife whose dad had seen many bursting tomatoes and one nearly blinding him cut them open for our first cooking together her across held one like a long and relieved sigh and we sighed This is Omitara James reading Bodies Like Oceans for Shug McDaniel. Spare me your thin tidings. Bring round your unsolicited fats, your baby fat, your tired fat, fat of the evening tide, fat of the early worm. Bring me that stubborn belly, fat of the unspoken, underserved, and unrequited, pocked, puckered, and long pummeled, fat on fat on fat, fat, flesh that responds to touch, jiggles at the suggestion, a provocation of fat, tested to withstand the fallow ire please don't mention the memory of muscle without the tensile tenure long live the cross-legged splendor of fat privilege oh slender stride whom do you comfort with your ease whose borders drape across your back clawed my way out of your clean love and into the world's fat shine world that works to burn me i stay alive and well rounded at every corner keep your thin spectacle your airy hula hoop fat of the forgotten republic 
I lift you out of the shade. Let your contours spill over with light. I offer not the lemon, but the sour grove as heaven. Why won't they stay inside? Is what Norte Americanos ask Mexicanos, like impatient parents. Acá, lo que nos va a matar es la crisis, anarchists say. Literal translation, here, here, origin. Germanic, Old English, Dutch, German, English. What will kill us is the crisis. Non-literal translation, aquí, aquí, origin, Spanish, Nina, Pinta, Santa Maria, blood, New Spain. It's not the virus, but the economy that will kill us. That's not what experts say. Sitting on El Balcón de la Condesa, you see, they've seen poverty. Once a week, they wander the Mercado de la Merced, donde los ricos gain admission to be salt of the earth. All it takes to know, to experience, to live poverty is 15 pesos, a dollar fifty. A dollar fifty buys you a taco, spiced with sweat, and the taste of a day's worth of work. And so that woman, renting her stall, does not need to make tacos or tortillas or traverse 30 miles on foot, on metro, on bus. She has everything she needs in quarantine. Why won't they stay inside? Michelle Viegas Threadgold. Mr. Limpet, minding his business, swept up in the trawl of the dawn's early light with the yellowtail, the cod, the haddock, the flounder, the halibut, the butterfish, the dogfish, the glass squid, the yeti crab, basket star, deep sea dancer, the gorgon's head, the armored sea robin, the sea angel, sea devil, sea pig, the squirt, the glowing sea cucumber, the small croaking sculpin, the orange sponge called monkey dung, the gulper eel, dragonfish, black belly sucker, the red paper lantern, the heart urchin, fangtooth, spookfish, the black snout, the kelp, the stones, the porpoise bones. Then the trawls, trawl, trawls. They trawl and trawl, trawls, until the trawls are all their trawling. A special on trawl at Maison de la Mer, filet du trawl, marinière. Mr. Limpet, his twilight last gleaming, disembarks in a crateful of ice. The channel is a working class stiff, buoys and ragged confederate flags, a cove line of crosses on cliffs. Look at what they built us, the pelicans think. Concrete piers and signal towers, all good things to shit on. The pelicans sit on the dock and take stock. Behind the fish, a fish, they say, and behind that fish, no fish at all, and behind no fish, no fishes. It's a port full of spines and postcard designs on the bite left behind in the sea rack. A Kodak stab at a shame-faced crab, a can opener rescue for the chowder shack. 
From here, the pelting and the smelting are emptied into the harbor. Further out, roustabouts, roughnecks, and derrick hands get paid to raid the larder. In the bed below the ferry boats, the cars on board umbilical, all of us driving farther away from the steeplejack sea in a race to be drier than drenched. From the jack-up rigs and the tension leg benches ablaze like St. Elmo's fire, a sound like the sound of a voice, its multiple choice on the subject of bleak versus dire. Science is inquiry, not answers, says the chemist, sipping the pot boiler gulf. From atop the continental shelf, Humpty Dumpty's daredevil fall, the boar that bores at the yoke of it all, a dredging as thorough as Darwin. I can't go no lower, said the hatter. I'm on the floor as it is. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for that really incredible work. I want to start by asking um, the poets and artists about their intentions behind their work. And while I'm doing that, I'll invite all of the audience to please add your questions to the chat. Uh, and, and we will uh, be very happy to address some questions and comments. Um, let's start with, uh, with, with you, Michelle, and with Bill. Uh, Michelle, maybe you can talk a little bit about uh, the, 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 the impetus and intention behind your work. Um, and then Bill, you can discuss uh, what you did with the video. And I'll just make one comment um, to start, which is that one of the things I found inc so incredibly adept and beautiful about the video are these very subtle moments, like when Michelle says, a key, a key and it and you repeat that image and we see the airplane go over the 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 um the fence the uh razor wire fence as if going over a border and then also how michelle's voice you you the the recording goes all the way past the um credits at the end and michelle sighs which feels really like what the, the poem, you know, wants at the end. It feels like what we all have at the end of that poem. Um, so anyway, uh, Michelle and Bill, maybe you can discuss a little bit. Thank you so much, Betsy. Um, <clears throat> I think for myself, what happened was, um, you know, I felt very separated during the pandemic from, from Mexico and particularly from my, my family and friends there, um, more so my, my friends. And, and, what I kept seeing was that people in Mexico were extremely struggling and their struggle wasn't getting covered. Or if it was the um, concept, sort of like the Americanized, um, you know, distanced view was why won't they stay inside? And um, I heard this over and over again. And actually the bourgeoisie class in Mexico also said this of the people who, you know, 80% of the population is so dependent on jobs that require that they are out in the public selling food at a stall. The, the people who are homeless depend on the people who have food stalls to give them food, to give them work. All of these things are interdependent. And when you ride a taxi cab in Mexico City, they have little pieces of chain so that when people are asking for money in the streets, they can give them, give it to them. And so with all of these people no longer able to work, 
I mean, people, I mean, the, the, the <laughs> starvation was so real. And yet there was this, this concept of like, why won't they stay inside? And so for me, it was sort of like um, taking the lens and flipping it back on this bourgeoisie class that feels so comfortable saying this both from the American uh, perspective and from like the upper class in Mexico and also sort of like these dilettantes. And so um, I just really wanted to kind of show how colonialism particularly so when I did this whole thing with that key and it kind of has to do with these uh, words and where they come from the derivation you know the Spain the germ uh, the Germans were all in Mexico and so this whole idea of like what needs to happen and like where we are today and after it's all connected and so that was kind of um, some of the intention of my piece. Thank you Bill. Yeah um, it I, I have a visual copy like a hard copy of Michelle's poem and some of what she's describing is diagrammed out um, for myself obviously uh, though I asked Betsy if she'd send me to Mexico to shoot footage she didn't but I don't blame her for that and um, so I was thinking about borders more and I'm not always like I didn't want to just illustrate the poem I was thinking about something that would be like a long scanning shot and then there's also architectures that are around borders or enclosure that are more or less universal to urban spaces. And the footage is actually Gowanus in Brooklyn. Um, and then, so just ideas of cracks and the wall and the, the barbed wire. I didn't want it to be over like st sort of heavy handed, but I also thought that it could be evocative. I think it's hilarious actually, Betsy, that you bring up that little breath at the end of the poem because I thought that was just something that I was only gonna notice, <laughs> but I liked it. So <laughs> I appreciate you calling it out. <laughs> um, you know, I just thought it, it seemed to work. I, I really appreciated that you did that Bill because for me personally, it was like, like I've just felt like my breath has been trapped. Like I can't breathe. And so when you did that, it was sort of like, it was just really poignant. So thank you. It was natural. I mean, it was just there, so. You technically you did it. <laughs> Great, thank you so much, um, Sabia and Omatera. Let's talk about your work um, and Omatera. Maybe again, you can talk about uh, the impetus, the intention behind uh, the poem, and Sabia, you can talk about what you you did with the video. And I will also just make a comment that the video um, really for me brought the um, something that I think about a lot, which is the connection between the body and the landscape and the fact that the landscape is a body. And in that sense, you know, um, this Cartesian split that, you know, Western culture is based on um, is, is, is a fallacy. And that the, uh, I think one of the ways that we actually uh, um, bring a consciousness to um, issues like food future is through the healing of that split. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the video really bore that, that point um, forth. Anyway. Uh, Thank you, Betsy. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'm so glad we're having this conversation. Uh, Toni Morrison says that the function of freedom is to free others. And so when I created this poem, um, I was really trying to free myself. There's such an oppression around people who are fat, people who take up space. Mm. And so I wasn't necessarily trying to write an inspirational poem. I'm trying to inspire myself because my own survival is what is at stake. Um, my, my wellness, my psychological, spiritual, physical wellness are what is being under attacked in this very kind of standardized, westernized um, colonial space in which I am trying to do more than survive, I'm trying to thrive. So I think that every artist on a certain level creates the work that they need to survive. And when it comes to the body, 
I absolutely believe that poetry begins in the body. And so there is an inextricable link between the poet and the poem. And very much in that same way, there is an inextricable link between food and the consumer of that food and the creator of that food. There's a, there's a thread that goes from planting the seed to um, being nurtured. And I think that's very sacred. And so I wanted to create space for people who are persecuted for taking up space, namely beginning with myself. And so freedom is a, is a thread of the poem. And I, I'm so grateful for um, the work um, and the artistry of Sabia and what she did to really explore and visualize uh, that thread. Wow, thank you. I'm, I'm truly honored. Um, I, I want to begin actually by thanking Betsy for inviting me and thanks to all of you for being on the panel. Thanks for all the organizers and everyone in attendance. Um, I was immediately taken uh, by the poem, just instantly uh, upon reading it. And then with Omatara sent me the audio, it was over, I was done, you know, just smitten. And um, a number of things were going through my mind. My initial thought was to uh, find images of people, of human bodies. And then I, in retrospect, thought, you know, that's somewhat cliche, perhaps that's expected and it's not advancing the, the work. And so other things that I was grappling with, um, the word fat is of course, as you're saying, Omatar, and in the North American US context, it's very, um, it's very laden with a lot of meaning and with a lot of stigma. Uh, you know, and the, it's, you know, from the media, from the dominant culture or whatever we're talking about, it's also very racialized and it's also very gendered. And I come from a, a culture where, you know, growing up in the 60s and the 70s, um, there was a word fat that was spelled P-H-A-T. And it was used to describe a very ample woman, a very curvaceous a woman that was valued and validated by the black male gaze and, you know, as a way of pushing back against Euro-American standards and Euro-American norms. And so in many ways, the word fat is a way of resisting, you know, it's a, it's a way of pushing back. And then what I hear, Omatara, in your voice and in your words, uh, are images of lushness, images of thickness, of saturation, of sumptuousness and deep, very, very deep color. And so what I was offering was another way of looking at the world and, um, you know, trees that are underwater, forests that are infused with magic uh, and beaches that are magical and, and fantastical in some sort of ways. Um, nature is fat for me, it's all encompassing and it sustains us spiritually and um, while enabling us to consume for our well-being, for the well-being of our bodies, um, gives us opportunities to relax and you know recreate in that beauty. And so that beauty sustains us in much the same way that food sustains us. And so I was attempting to convey all that in the work. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Srilesh, oh, um, your, your, uh, your video um, was, I know, really a, a very much a collaborative uh, process with Viswan, who could not be with us today. Oh, yes. um, and I thought you could talk about both about your intention behind the poem and also your, uh, your intentions um, and experiences of collaborating with Viswan on the um, on the video, and I will make the comment that what I find fascinating about your poem is that the tomato is both uh, is is both metaphor for political violence, um, and is also and and also um, is is actual is real is real food and eating um, is. Um, uh, calling out the economics um, mm -hmm. of, of eating. And 
ultimately uh, is a symbol of redemption and love. Um, so those are all the things I was thinking about um, as I watched the, the video and I'll turn it over to you. Uh, first of all, thank you. Thank you, uh, Betsy, and uh, thank you for having me here and all the panelists and uh, people in attendance. Um, like every poem, the intention behind this poem is actually self-expression, you know. Uh, it's like, you know, finding my own voice and finding uh, the, 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 the traumas I have been through. But this uh, COVID lockdown has actually provided me with an opportunity to look into me. Uh, like I spent more than seven months in Taurus. Uh, and uh, my time outside was very limited. So it has given me a time to brew a kind of uh, uh, self introspection that offered me to understand myself better. So it was just during this time when I discovered that there are a lot of things in me that wanna express themselves. And at the, t at the same time, I found one thing that we are living in a world where oppressive systems are governing us institutional harassments are going on everywhere. Uh, I don't want to single out the names and call out them, but it's a kind of philosophy that functions in our society today. So I, somebody, uh, I somehow wanted to address this, you know, but uh, when I began writing, when I got this call from, from uh, you to uh, offer a poem, suddenly to everything poured out. It is only then I understood or discovered that it has been there for in, in me for long. And it only needed just to remove the lid to come out everything from me. So what I understood actually was the intention is to express the, the traumas that has been there. And you might ask, uh, what are these traumas actually? And where, the, where are the sources of these traumas are from? You know, actually, um, uh, personally, uh, it is like, you know, I'm living in a place where this clash all the time. Clash not in the sense of um, at, a, at a ballot box or, or, or another way, but they are literally clashing. They kill people. And there are incidents of, uh, uh, political murders here that happens, you know, um, very frequently. Uh, that's not the past. That's happening even even recent days. It's not recent days, but maybe maybe in recent months. That's happening all the time. And at the same time, my family, my my father, and uh, some of my relatives suffered a lot, you know, uh, from these attacks. And my father had a knife wound that would, that would have been fatal if, it had, if he hadn't blocked it, that was the, the knife that was coming to his neck, you know. So it, it is part of his trauma that I am expressing as well as my trauma. And growing up, I remember my father usually telling these stories to me incident, I can say a little more about the tomato which you have brought up here. You know, I remember my father telling something like this when one, one of his friend got stabbed and he died. And when father went to the morgue to see his body, he came out and later when he told me that, you know, uh, actually it was like a tomato exploded. His belly was like a tomato exploded. So that got stuck in my mind. When I began writing this poem, suddenly these lines, his words, everything came in, into, the, into the place. So what I want to say is that it is his poem I'm actually writing, not my poem. Um, it is always said that the poetry or poem is not your own. It's partly conscious, it's partly unconscious. So I'm trying to fuse this conscious and unconscious here. And about Vishwan Sorba, it's a discovery. Vishwan uh, was actually spending his time in Mumbai as a, as a visual artist and as a photographer, as a video artist. And he came to Kerala and we met uh, through his father. And um, when I brought the idea to him, he said, he immediately jumped at it. And he said, we are going to do this. Uh, we are going to do this. And we went to our in-laws home. It's a small house. And there is one story as well. My, my father-in-law actually got one uh, knife bone during one of these uh, clashes back in 1970s. 
And uh, the basic idea of this poem actually is about uh, the emergency that India faced in 1975, between 1975 and uh, 1977, uh, almost 21 months, India was in a dark, it was a dark place. All the civil liberties were curtailed. And uh, during those period, most of this violence took place and a lot of people were in the jails and um, police atrocities were so widespread. So, and in those days, people like my father who is in his seventies and her father, my wife, uh, uh, who is in his equally in the seventies, you know, uh, they have a lot of stories to say, but they, they don't say the stories. They have uh, these traumas and stories in them and which I want to express myself. I remember I, when I spent the time there in his home several times, he used to say the same thing. Those days police came in the home and unmasked and they would drag the people out and so many stories are there, you know, and which I want to express. So this house, which we took for filming the video was the right place. And uh, one day, a group of people chased him and uh, and and uh, knifed him from the side there. He got a knife wood on his back right there at the house, in you know, somewhere close to the house. So the house was, became the perfect setting for this poem. So we used this uh, everything that is possible for there to film this video. We wanted uh, to put somebody in the jail, so we used this uh, window somewhere there and made it as a sort of uh, jail bars how the video evolved even at the time of doing this video we had no idea where would it reach because this is a poem and the vision was new to doing a poem as a visual so he said that i have no idea where the poem is going and where the videos the video would reach so uh, it was like uh, he was reading the poem several times he was asking asking me so many questions why you said this why you want to do this uh, do you want the candle or a or a or a regular uh, lamp wick uh, lighted somewhere in the room. So we decided what should be that. We have not in, in, enough uh, equipments with us. We have not enough uh, accessories with us. We are just uh, using everything possible and available to us. That's how the video actually came about. Thank you so much, Srilash. Um, Carolyn. Let's talk about our piece. Uh, I can say that um, it's the bottom was the second of a book length uh, poem that I wrote um, in a series of book length poems, which are loosely based on the elements and that are echo poetic um, books uh, that are about humans, a very troubled relationship to the landscape and to the environment um, and to our need to change our consciousness so that we can all survive on earth and so that the earth can survive. Um, so uh, you may not know the character, Mr. Limpet. So I'll just tell you about him. He is a mid-century cartoon. Um, he's a guy played by the actor Wally Cox, who was a comic actor of the era. Uh, he's like obsessed with his fish tank and he falls into the water and becomes a cartoon fish. And then I think he, he does something like saves the US from some bombing in World War II or something like that. But Mr. Limpet as a character in this was my way of, of you know, asserting that when we are trawling the oceans, we are trawling ourselves. You know, we are destroying ourselves as we destroy every other being and that we must do things differently. So I was trying to sort of center the human with, with, within um, these, these large, you know, forces of destruction, so many of which have to do with food production. Um, and Carolyn is somebody who I've collaborated with many times. Um, so uh, Carolyn, maybe you want to talk about the video a little bit. Yeah, uh, one correction, it's Don Knotts who plays- Don Knotts. The incredible Mr. Limpet. And I, I bought the film to watch it again. So uh, it's fresh in my mind. Um, yeah, so Betsy and I collaborated on another extended prose poem of hers called um, New, New Jersey. And or it's called Turnpike, right? No, it's called New Jersey. And I called my video Turnpike because we spent a lot of time on the road together, stopping at um, locations like kind of referenced in her poem, but this time being, you know, uh, dis you know socially distanced and um, spending a lot of time indoors. I thought, well, how am I gonna do this poem about the bottom of the ocean when, you know, I don't even have time 
uh, to get out to the ocean to photograph, but I've been working on projects about climate change for a while. And so I had some video footage of um, being out on the ocean. Um, so those, the video footage of oceans came from the Great Barrier Reef and the Kingdom of Tonga and Hawaii, uh, those oceans, some of the photographs and videos that I used of my own. Um, but then I started thinking about, you know, how I approached the topic of climate change when I did my project called The Witness Tree, which is I went from doing more um, emotional landscapes like the one behind me in my background to documentary style, um, you know, photographs. I wanted to show the truth about climate change because there's so much denial here in the United States. And so I went back and looked at all my photographs, um, videos and started calling them. But then I love how in Betsy's work, how she does these lists and it's like, you know, fish after fish after fish. And of course, I didn't know what they half of them look like. So I started just researching um, as I was working on it. And similarly, um, DK, I was like writing Betsy and like, what did you mean by this line? But once I started finding all these really amazing sea creatures, I thought I have to show them, you know, so through um, you know, stock photography and um, public domain photography and fair use imagery, I just decided it had to be almost like a catalog of all of these, uh, you know, creatures that are being basically destroyed by us. Um, and, you know, I had been learning about the ways the warming ocean temperatures are impacting things like the oysters, you know, who can no longer like set themselves in the oceans. They're all being, you know, bred indoors and then put out um, in the ocean, especially in the Pacific Northwest and um, turtles are being impacted. You know, the warming ocean temperatures are making them um, only produce females, right? So they're, they're you know, they're, you know, species could die out. So I started thinking about this, this fact of just wanting to show these amazing animals and, um, you know, kind of have just, again, you know, the, like give them their, their less than um, 15 minutes of fame, they're less than five seconds in most cases um, as Betsy's, Betsy's reading that list of them. So it was really nice, but it, it did feel like even though we were separate, I would, you know, write her and, you know, we were collaborating back and forth um, through texting and email. Um, so for me, it was um, it was just a really great chance to work with Betsy again, and then to also talk about issues that are uh, you know near and dear to me, you know, which is how we're impacting our, our the the world around us, the nature around us. Yeah, I, I also I love how um, showing you know all of the sea creatures, showing the pelicans, showing gives them their personhood, really, you know, um, for lack of a better word, you know, give, gives them their selfhood all these creatures. I thought maybe we could unmute our mics and and, um, uh, and take some turns talking about the connections we see between the work. Um, and, and anybody can sort of start with, uh, you know, what they see as a connection between, you know, say their video and somebody else's or broader connections that we can, we can uh, bring to the discussion. I know, Michelle, you had some something to say about this? Yeah, I mean, I had a lot of thoughts, which I thought like all of our films, um, one of the connections I really saw was this, this theme of not just consumption, but you know, it was really interesting uh, when Sabio was describing like the male gaze and fatness. And I was, um, in a former life, I was a server and I also worked in restaurant kitchens and I did stuff like that. And um, what the pandemic has really brought to my mind is how all of these in institutions depended on people's I won't use the word, uh, but like subjugation essentially, and that they're consuming and they're profiting off and getting things from other people being in a lower status than them. Those people who can't afford their own homes, who are like the, all of that together. And so when I was watching um, Betsy's piece, like I just felt, felt like it was all connected of like what you eat, how it affects the world, how it affects the environment. Omatara's piece of like how we consume people as as if they're not people, you know, as, as we just look at them and we are removed. And then my piece was much more about all of these different systems that work to sort of dehumanize and people as being consumed as if they're like products, you know? So I, um, those were just some of the connections I got um, with, with Srilash. I mean, that, that was much more, um, violence also what i was thinking about is like that the commercialization of violence is like we see this image of of pain of poverty whatever and it's like consumable like oh yes you know the people of india are very violent like those kinds of like ridiculous comments um that become consumed as stories you know so those are just some of the connections that i saw personally 
Well, thank you for that shout out. I'll go since my name was shouted out <laughs> initially. And um, I thought the films were connected in just an amazing way. And on some level, it very simplistically boils down for me to this common theme of humanity and our very visceral need to be sustained and, you know, sustained by what, you know, for me, those forces that sustained us in addition to the very physical, tangible need for food, you know, is the desire for beauty and for justice. And so that was what tied all the films together for me in a sense. It's like whether we're, you know, uh, well, let me just preface it, that our desire for beauty and justice is very much rooted in the specifics of our culture and our background, right? Um, and then um, the overlapping imagery of containment that I think was in your work, Michelle and William, you know, the, with the fencing and everything, but also the sky was there. So that tension between containment and freedom to me was very much there. And the violence that was done either to human bodies uh, or to the environment itself. Um, and then reveling in the beauty, the glorious, the gloriousness, the gloriousness that is this earth. Um, so to me, that was what was tying them all together. Absolutely. Um, Sabia, when you said containment, uh, that struck a chord, but also I think, um, so there's a, there's a resistance, right, that I think runs through all of these videos. And also, I mean, what is more violent than food capitalism? You know, I'm just gonna say it, that food capitalism is violent and it's bullshit. And there's such an abundance that is really just oppressed on so many different cultural, economic, levels and we're living in a time of um just sparsity just we're living through this pandemic in which there are these false uh famines i mean people are, are actually literally dying and that is that is created by us right that's created by our systems of standardization of our um corporate greed and there's just a squeezing and i just found sure that image and you and you spoke about the impetus of the tomato and your 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 father's story and experience but that explosion just to me i think resonates throughout that image resonates throughout all of our work it's just this idea of being squeezed and then you know exploding with with life like where does where does energy go when you're kind of oppressing it when you're when where does abundance where does love where you know we're there's so much, we have so much and we, we hoard it. And we, and we saw that during the pandemic, but just there's like a systematized hoarding of resources and um, you know, there has to be uh, consequences and, and we're living and trying to navigate those consequences. So yeah, the violence and um, the, the food capitalism, I mean, I think that connects us all. We're all connected, no matter um, where we are on that spectrum. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? For me, I think I can talk. Yes. Yes. Uh, I find this all videos deeply connected in many ways. So the, uh, in the basic level, you know, it's about uh, food, but it's actually about the different aspects of our life, uh, life we are living today. On one hand, we are exp uh, we are exploiting the, the the resources, and on the other, it's about you know the body shaming, violence, and about uh, Michelet's poem. I like that poem like every other poem here. Uh, it connects me with uh, the situation in there during the uh, lockdown. Hundreds and thousands of people, migrant workers, they were on the roads. They have they had no 
no vehicles to take them to their to their homes they were walking and walking so when i read and watched the video it reminded me of the the very difficult situation these people underwent and about uh, betsy's poem it was a sur surprise for me to see that many number of uh, sea animals and creatures and uh, to understand their identity what they look like and uh, how easily we we kill them, we eat them, we destroy them. And the poem is more, it's, it's, it takes the poem from that to somewhere like, you know, a, 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 to a political understanding that exploitation is the, is the serious politics happening today in every sense, exploitation, that, that, that is mindlessly uh, happening everywhere. So you are actually uh, opening our eyes to that truth. And, uh, and I found, uh, I found this, these things connected. And my poem is talking about the violence, violence that's happening. So basically these poems are questioning the culture today. All these works are questioning the culture we are living today. So in that level, I think uh, uh, the poem is actually doing it justice. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to uh, remind um, attendees to please ask your questions in, in the Q&A. Um, we do have a couple of questions there, but but I, I did this, this conversation is leading me to ask um, another question uh, that's really important to me because I think about it all the time, which is what are the, what is the use, you know, what are the uses of, of poetry and art? Um, we, I think we're talking about witnessing here, really. Um, and witnessing is really important. Um, it, I do wonder if witnessing is how transformative witnessing is. Um, I think it can really be transformative, uh, but, I, but I wonder if we're thinking about, you know, thinking food futures, what is our role as artists and poets? You know, what is the usefulness of the work? Um, and I feel like I, I, I have a healthy skepticism about it and I continue to have that skepticism and I write against that skepticism. Um, and so, and, and in my work, I try to implicate myself, you know, because I think it's really important, you know, to implicate myself, uh, particularly as a white Western person, but just also as a human living on the earth. Um, so, so I guess I want to open that to, to everybody and maybe um, Bill and Carolyn have an, um, Maybe you want to address this um, in terms of your art. You know, what's, you know, what do you see the broader sort of purpose and usefulness um, in terms of this sort of these this issue? You know, or these broader issues about how we trans you know, how how the world goes forth. You know, how do you see your your role as an artist? Yeah, um, I'm happy to talk about that because I feel like a lot of my work, especially revolving around climate issues, is about the activism component of it. It's not enough for me to just make pictures that people go, wow, that's really, you know, interesting story. Or that's a really beautiful place. I try to get them involved in the, I hate to say it's a political issue, but it's become a political issue. So I do um, events where I have people, you know, from recycled materials, um, you know, look at my photographs and then listen to me talk about the project maybe, and then write, uh, postcards to politicians about their con their own concerns and you know they range from like you know plastic bans to you know you know little kids writing about like you know stop driving cars and so to me they're really getting especially children involved and thinking about the fact that they can have a voice and let's you know start start them young and you know have them reach out to their politicians and say hey you know I'm, I'm paying attention so um, for me the the act of making art and then collaborating is really important and I, I teach photography and I talk to my students all the time about like, it's important to collaborate. It's important to, you know, share ideas and express that with just an individual person or a group of people, maybe something like Residency Unlimited in a larger sense, but then also with the general public. So yeah, I hope these become available to other people to share and um, show to their students, show to their children. You know, I think it's important to get that message out there. And I think with love, I'm gonna push back a little bit, Betsy, against this idea of witnessing. I mean, witnessing certainly does occur uh, in poetry, but I think it's so much more than that. Um, for me, uh, you know, I think that if you write a poem um, and it's a you know political poem, whatever that means, and the person who hears it. Uh, still uh, continues to live 
um, a daily life in which they're not examining their own prejudices and um, there is no uh, change in how they uh, interact with others or consider others or consider um, themselves, then um, it's not a successful poem. And so what I'm trying to do uh, in my poetry is like in this poem, you know, I say the word fat over and over and over again, and that's going to make some people uncomfortable. My physical body makes some people uncomfortable. And so I think in all art, whether it's poetry or whatever the genre is, there needs to be um, space created where people can listen, hear, um, witness, and feel uncomfortable and um, kind of sit with that discomfort and let it work on them. When I think about the works of art that I return to, they're the ones that are constantly working on me that I'm thinking about that I don't necessarily like in that moment. And I don't write poems so that people like them or praise them, but I write poems so that, you know, uh, people kind of ho will hopefully take take what I'm saying, how I'm saying it, how I'm crafting it, and I want that to be working on them. And so if they hear a poem of mine and they're um, still uh, not only just holding these prejudices, but um, speaking about fat people in a certain way, making jokes, um, making assumptions, then I don't think my work is um, important or essential. And I will keep creating and keep failing um, at communication until that actual change happens and uh, people enact um, the, 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 the pain and the violence of the poem. They can enact that in themselves and then um, really change in some kind of way. The change has to happen. So I think that uh, art can lead to change. Maybe that's naive, but um, I'm gonna die on that cross. Mm -hmm. Okay, Bill. You haven't spoken. Yeah, um, I, it's, I've been both a full-time activist and devoted a lot of time to art. And I do think that we're touching on a lot of these issues because you can make artless activism for sure. People do it all the time. And it's one of those things that I think really is um, damaging to the left. Mm -hmm. And you can also make art in a vacuum and that is doesn't make it not art, but it, it's not until you reach somebody or it starts communicating with people that it starts affecting them. And so Amatera, I, I'm totally in agreement. Like this idea that it needs, my hope is that it um, either through collaboration or practice, you're changing the way people perceive. Uh, you've, you've caused a disruption in their regular and it could be as simple as seeing so many fish <laughs> that you don't know exist and then possibly thinking that, oh, like understanding that diversity isn't just about diversity, it's that we can't possibly conceive how complex the world is. And humans do nothing except simplify and simplify the world through the destructive practices. And every time we lose a segment of diversity that can't come back, like that is a loss that we feel but don't feel and see but don't see, right? And that's like, if art does anything, hopefully, I mean, one of the things it can do is attend to that disruption, I guess, mm -hmm. um, and build community, hopefully. <laughs> like these conversations, I, I think is another another place that it works. I think I just wanted to kind of riff off what um, Bill and Omitar both said. So one, one aspect of, of art and poetry for me is as a catalyst for change. It's not the change itself, but it can also help build these like human connections and Something so I'm I'm writing a book right now on Rage Against the Machine, and part of when I'm writing that book, like I'm rooting it in all of these different music movements that changed the world. Like what's hap what happened in Puerto Rico, where they overthrew the governor, and it was Bad Bunny, you know, Ricky Martin, all of these people taking to the streets and saying like, overthrow this guy. And then musically, like this has happened over and over again. We've seen it in Mexico. We've seen it in Chile with women denouncing feminicide and the government in action. And how did they do it? They did it through song, pointing to the government saying, you, you are the rapist and singing that and dancing in like full dance lines, you know? And so there's this aspect of, 
this like communal celebration of art is often what allows people to see and confront their power, like you know, the, the, the challenges they face, it, like gives them that strength. So sometimes art isn't the change itself, but hopefully it can be the catalyst. Well, and if I could, I would say that that's the opposite of what capitalism does to art, right? So capitalism creates artists, makes, makes it so that artists are individuals and they're supposed to be working as individuals with creating a product that is then consumed by usually the wealthy. And that undercuts, I mean, that's deliberate to me, right? That's one of the many deliberate things that that structural injustice, that structural economy does to the world. It divests community from its culture and art. Um, and that's one of the things that hopefully we, we can struggle against. I wanted to add something too. Uh, I think your question is super important. And I think the answers are, um, there's lots of tension kind of replete in the answer. And just as a way of contextualizing this, uh, you know, I'm here in Washington, DC this weekend, the city has had descended upon us, white supremacists, Nazis, MAGA people, Proud Boys, et cetera. And one of the first things that they do is they go down to the fence that's surrounding the White House and they tear down the art. Art that people organize and come back and put back up again, right? And in that art are images of people who've been killed by the police, primarily African-Americans, trans people, women, children, men all over the country, um, messages about social justice, anti-Trump messages, powerful stuff that you will go down there and weep looking at it. And I've done that, I filmed it. Etc. So that's the one of the first things they do. So that tells you automatically about the value of the art, how important it is that it angers them so much that this work is there. Um, so for me, um, as an artist, number one, I'm compelled. It's, a, it's an act of compulsion. I don't have a choice. I've been doing this since I was a kid. Got to do it. You know, and if I don't do it enough, I'm not balanced. There's something that's wrong. Um, that's off with me. So there's that. And then um, art is very necessary. And in terms of the positive ramifications of it, it can help to build community, to mobilize. Uh, representation is very important. You know, again, growing up in the 60s, not seeing anyone who looked like me, very problematic, you know? Um, so it's, it's not just a superficial thing. It is valuable, but not in and of itself. I mean, perhaps it can be, but it also gives an opportunity for us to have conversations and it's an outlet in many different ways. So, you know. Well, of course, the fascists also have their bands. And there are, I mean, that's, that has been a, an organizing practice for fascism in the US through the 80s, 90s, I mean, just consistently. And they are, I, I, I'm only saying that to, it's that it's that complicated, right? Like the art is somewhat neutral. It's the practitioners and the practice that can really, because uh, uh, they also feel the power of it, right? like and they, they use the power of it. Um, but we have to be better. <laughs> well, you know, I used to think too about, um, you know, a lot of times when I give my presentations about climate change that it's to people who are already, you know, understand it, believe it or nodding their heads. And I used to think I wanted to convert the deniers. And then I realized like, why do I wanna waste my breath? I'd rather just like preach to the choir and make our voices louder, you know, rather than trying to convert the people who I, I don't think are gonna, um, you know, be converted, so. Well, thank you everyone. We are pretty much, uh, we've gone over time. Um, I'd like to thank everybody, uh, all the attendees and all of the participants. Uh, this panel will be recorded, has been recorded and will be available um, in, a, uh, in a link um, which Residency Unlimited will send out to any, everybody. Uh, if anybody has a closing comment, um, otherwise I, I'd like to wrap it up and, and thank uh, all the artists um, and poets again, Omatera James, Sabia Prince, BK Srilesh, Carolyn Minastra, um, uh, Viswan Zoraba, William Maza, and uh, Michelle Viegas, um, Thread Gold, for your participation. Thank you so much. Uh, it's been Fantastic. Um, and uh, please stick around for more of Residency Unlimited's uh, symposium for the rest of the day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you, Betsy. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Betsy. Thanks, everyone. Bye.